Everybody has a starting point. For you, for me, for him, for her. Joining God on mission has to start somewhere. That somewhere might look like your office, your neighborhood, your school, or even your family. But no matter what your starting point looks like, it's the same for you as it is for everybody else. Your starting point is you allowing God to use you right where you are. But how do you get there? Starting point will take you and your friends down that road. Starting Point will help you discover the mission God has for you. And Starting Point will prepare you to live that mission out. Yeah, this is Starting Point. Every believer's got one. Now, are you ready to find out where your Starting Point leads you? So most people know Puerto Rico as the enchanted island because it's gorgeous, it's just beautiful. But underneath that beauty, there's so many people that are broken. And that is why we're here because we see the hopelessness, we see the lostness, and we know that the gospel is the only solution. So we look to the local church and we look to the pastors to assess those needs. We make sure that we have the materials and the volunteers to connect with that specific need because ultimately we want every family that we serve to be connected to a local church. But the story doesn't end there. We cannot do this without people sacrificially giving. When you give, it allows us to not just to rebuild a roof, but it allows us to have an impact in the lives of people. That's what I'm seeing all over the island. And that's what I want the whole world to see. Our life in Florence would be categorized as we made it. We have a nice house, we have a pool, we have a six-figure income. Ultimately, we lack nothing. My name is Eric McDonald. My name is Heather McDonald. I am an ER doctor in Florence, Alabama. I'm a registered nurse. We have seven children. Have an amazing house and an amazing life. But that's not what God had planned for us. So that I am selling. That life at the McDonald house is crazy. Uh, with seven kids, it can be a challenge. It's organized chaos at its, at its best, and maybe a little more chaos than organized. Towards the end of residency, Eric got up one night and said, the Lord is calling me to missions, but I'm not sure what that looks like. But very specifically told God that he was not a missionary. <laughs> I told God I was not a missionary, but God continued to work in my heart. God confirmed that call, even for me, that it was full-time career cross-cultural missions. We have never been anywhere internationally. No, we're moving a family of nine to a village in Kigoma, Tanzania. We are joining a team with Larry and Sally Pepper who are absolutely amazing. There is a hospital in town that is an openly Christian hospital in a Muslim area. People know that if they come into the hospital for treatment, they will hear the gospel. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for this family. Thank you for our Every person in this world has needs. Their physical needs, temporary needs, and their eternal needs. Being a doctor in the States is really, really awesome at meeting physical needs. Amen. We had money, we had a nice house, we had everything that we really ever wanted or dreamed of. But Jesus is teaching us very clear that that's not what's important. Uh, in fact, he says, sell everything and follow me. And the reason being is that he gives a command. And that command is to go and make disciples of all the nations. And there are plenty of people in the world that have never heard that name. And that's an eternal need that nobody can meet but Jesus. But we have to tell him. Scripture is very clear that we have to tell him. So as a I can go help people. And I have a call and a, a sense of urgency to help people. But my helping is only temporary if I'm not telling them about Jesus, whose fix is eternal. You missed a spot. We're making this move because it's a call on our lives from the Lord. We would do this no matter what, 
However, because of the cooperative program really enables us to focus on the Great Commission. And we love that. Numbers. We live by numbers. We track and count and measure everything. And sometimes we think the only numbers that really matter are the big ones. But it's the single digits that make the difference. The Bible says that heaven rejoices with the number one. Yeah, heaven rejoices each time even one person comes to know Jesus. We pastors dream about big numbers, and we should. But a daily focus on one meaningful interaction for Christ, that's the true difference maker. One friend, one family member, one coworker, one person at a time. We want to see God move in our nation like we have never seen before, but it all starts with one. I've got my one, and now I'm challenging you and your church to join us and to find yours. Because ultimately, the only number that really matters is one. Who's your one? Water. It's a building block of life that many of us access with ease. But in some parts of the world, it's a scarce commodity. One in 10 people lack access to clean water. Nearly 1,000 children under age five die every day from water relief. Some people spend up to six hours a day gathering water for their basic needs. And the missionaries who serve in these countries are at risk as well. This is where Pure Water, Pure Love takes action. Pure Water, Pure Love provides filters for missionaries all over the world. We also fund clean water projects like wells for the communities where missionaries serve. From Tijuana to Zimbabwe to China, Pure Water, Pure Love has provided thousands of filters and wells to missionaries and their communities. And we're nowhere near done. By 2025, half the world's population is expected to live in water-stressed areas. Our goal is to meet this need by equipping missionaries with clean water resources so the people they serve can hear about the living water. Help us bring relief to the thirsty while supporting those who take the gospel to all nations. I bet you think you have us all figured out. I mean, if I say New Orleans, some kind of picture's got to pop into your head, right? You probably imagine a party in the French Quarter, or a neighborhood that never came back from Katrina. Or you think about jambalaya and gumbo and crawfish. That's okay, we understand. Every city says we're different, but in New Orleans, we take different to a whole nother level. But you wanna know a secret? We're really a lot like you. Yeah, it might surprise you to learn we're pretty normal. We live in neighborhoods, we have houses and kids and jobs, and we all want and need the same things you do. Yeah, all one million of us. We want to be loved. We want to have hope. We need to meet Jesus. You might think we've all been there and done that. Geographically, we live in the Bible Belt, but culturally, we might as well be living on another planet. Only one out of 10 of us attends an evangelical church. The other nine out of 10, well, they don't. And those people matter. They matter to God. They matter to us. And we hope they matter to you. We're starting churches for them. We're meeting needs in our community and we're sharing Jesus with them. And no, we're not asking you to help us. We're asking you to join us. We're asking you to be a part of what God's already doing here. There's nothing better than that. Yeah, there's nothing better than one day when someone says New Orleans, this is the picture everyone sees. The third major storm of the year to make landfall has destroyed thousands of homes and lives throughout the Caribbean. Everyone's been talking about storms. Sometimes storms make the news, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes life storms hit when the cameras aren't looking. For the child who needs a family, for the stranger in a strange land, 
the teenager who's trafficked, the family that goes without, the man who's caught in the path of disaster, there is hope. We are Send Relief. People have been talking about hurricanes. People have responded. But for people caught in all kinds of storms, the ones in the spotlight and the ones in the shadows, there is hope. Learn how you can help at sendrelief.org. opportunity for the church to engage with partners like the American Red Cross and the Westchester Fire Department. We chose to pursue this opportunity to do the home fire campaign because it didn't require much work, honestly, but there was going to be a tremendous payoff, as well as just being able to partner with the fire department and the American Red Cross. I've been working with the Captain of Loss Prevention and coming alongside of him, I think that it's been neat to see his heart and see his vision and how he wants to serve the community. The partnership between the Lakota Hills and the American Red Cross is, is really important to the Westchester Fire Department because Red Cross is able to supply at a no cost to the fire department and Lakota Hills with all the volunteers they have would never be able to reach as many homes that we can without this partnership. Partnering with uh, Lakota Hills has been fabulous. Whenever the Red Cross has the opportunity to reach out to the community partners, it's a win-win for both of us. Our message has always been uh, fire safety. Um, and fire safety begins with the people at home. There's fires every day and work and smoke detectors are number one uh, reason people get out of their homes alive. We're doing this just simply to serve our community. They're engaging the community through serving, and hopefully they meet some new friends out in the community by doing this. Just hearing the excitement from our congregation as they came back from serving and the different stories they had. The different stories, you know, uh, every single person had a story. So this isn't just a one day event. This is something that we'll be able to still continue to minister to, uh, not just the homeowners, who would also be able to minister to the different organizations that we're a part of today. I really believe people who know Jesus, when they're given an opportunity to serve their community in an organized fashion, I think they just jump at it. I just said, hey, let's do this together. And the congregation responded. It was just who they are as believers. I think they want to serve a community.
Ah, delicious. Well, welcome to announcement time with your student pastor, Tori Allman. I have decided to switch to coffee this week instead of espresso, so hopefully I'll speak a little bit slower. All right, Wade's reception this afternoon after the 1045 service. Make sure you come on out and hang out with us uh, and celebrate his 20 years here at Malden First Baptist. So again, that's after the 1045 service. If you're in the first service, go grab your brunch and uh, come back and join us. Uh, Tuesday, we've got the kids messy painting. Now, here's the deal, it's messy painting. We are gonna be painting, we got canvases you can paint, but we are gonna probably end up throwing, spraying, squirting paint all over everybody and everything. So you're gonna wanna wear some old clothes and you're gonna wanna bring some clothes to change into because um, yeah, I don't think many of your parents will want you getting in the car with your painted clothes. Although maybe it'll make your car look prettier. I don't know, I'll, I'll leave that up to your parents, but that's from one o'clock till four o'clock on Tuesday. Speaking of Tuesday, the youth, we've got to bring your own dinner night this Tuesday for our Bible study and hangout times. Uh, so come on out, it's from six o'clock to nine o'clock. Repeat after me, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. All right, we've got a little joke going on how we always get a text every week. What time is youth this week? Same time it was last week. <laughs> Then Wednesday, um, we got Carowinds. So the youth are gonna go to Carowinds. Tickets have been bought, but uh, there should still be some space on the bus if you wanna go, let me know, and uh, then we can um, make sure we got a spot for that. So we'll leave here at the church at nine o'clock in the morning, be back around 10 o'clock or so. Uh, we can text you whenever we're pulling out and see how traffic is and all that good stuff. Uh, Wednesday, speaking of Wednesday, the 30th, at seven o'clock, there's choir rehearsal with Howie. So if you're singing the choir for the 4th of July, come on out so that way you can get all rehearsed up and ready to go for that. Speaking of 4th of July, uh, we've got all types of fun festivities and activities going on. There'll be Sunday school from nine o'clock and then nine o'clock to 9.45 and then at 10 o'clock the service will be going on and um, we're having one service that day. And then after that, we're gonna have a picnic on the grounds. So we'll start eating about 11.15 or so. So come on out. You're gonna wanna wear your festive attire, 4th of July attire. Uh, and be ready for the picnic afterwards. There'll be all types of fun activities and probably some water stuff because like I said, it is the 4th of July and it's a thousand degrees here. So humid in the South. All right, I think that is it for now. I hope you all have a fantastic week and we look forward to seeing you at one of these great activities we got going on. Have a great week. Don't you love Tori's energy with all that? Just kind of wakes you up. If you're not awake already, you are now after watching that guy. It must be the coffee that he drinks. I don't know. Um, but we have a busy place around here, and we hope you're informed about all that's going on, especially about what happens later on after the service. You'll hear more about that a little bit later as well. The, the chance to gather together in worship is something that we've all underestimated as 2020 uh, uh, rolled through, and then we all encountered what it's like to not meet together regularly. So the chance that we have in worship to meet together, I think we're all a little bit more attuned to what beauty that is and uh, what a tremendous power that is. You know, worship together is powerful because we're reminded that our God is a promise-keeping God. Whatever He says will happen, He makes sure will happen. He's somebody that we can trust. And so we remember all that He's done and who He is, His character, as we sing about who He is. And so we invite you this morning, let's sing about His character, His love. Stand with us as we, as we worship. I will sing forever of your love come down with my hands to heaven shout your praises loud I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out I will sing forever of your love come down Here we go was blind, I could not see, chains of sin had shackled me, but God in heaven heard my plea, and Jesus, Jesus, rescued me, oh Jesus, Jesus, rescued me, here we go, I will sing forever, your love come down, with my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud, I was lost in Oh, sweet, it floods my 
my soul and hope eternal won't let go. I dare erase at Calvary. Then Jesus, Jesus, rescued me. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, rescued me. I will sing forever. storm that surrounds me just one word the darkness has to retreat just one touch I feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can do. Just one word. You hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can do, there's not a prison while He can Praise the name that breaks away. There's nothing that our God can do. Oh. I will believe for greater things. There's the power, like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree 
There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like Power of Jesus, let rain arise, let all agree, there's no power like His power, there's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move, oh praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing, there's nothing that Jesus can do. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall He can break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do.
my fear will cease I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King God, we come to you offering our lives, offering our hearts, and as this small thing that you've ordained for us, we come to you with our offerings. We know, God, you've provided for us. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You give us everything that we have, even the breath in our lungs. Let this be a very small thing in our hearts and a joy to give back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First Peter says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. May this be our testimony, our joy, and our celebration. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the dark
Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. You delight in the offering. You have the heavens to call your own, but you abide in the song we sing. Ten thousand angels surround your throne to bring you praise that will never see. Hallelujah from heaven Lord Still your favor with men We sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah We sing hallelujah
powerful day to come when every knee bows before your day. But we will not wait until it does. For here and now shall your kingdom privilege to be your daughters and your sons this morning. Would you open our ears and open our eyes as your word is preached for us, and it's open for us. May we see what you have for us today. We do love you. We do honor you. We do bow at your knee, knowing that one day, for all of time and for all eternity, that will happen it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I hope that you all not only sang the words, but made the decision to worship. Worship is more than simply the act or the behavior but rather worship is a decision where we say out of all things, out of all circumstances, out of all of our feelings, out of all of our choices, we make the choice as we just sang. We sing hallelujah. We choose to praise the Lord. And that's a daily choice that we make. Every time we come into this building, the opportunity to make that decision and to remember that God made a decision when he created us. That when God made us, he knew that we would turn from him. He knew that we would fall away. He knew that we would come up short. But instead of allowing us to be punished for our sins as we deserved, God decided to send Jesus as our Savior. Long before the first sin was committed, Jesus was already being prepared as our offering. God decided that he loved us more than his law. And that's what led him to send Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whosoever shall believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We're in a series right now talking about decisions. And decisions are so much more, at least they should be, so much more than facts and figures and votes and majorities, but rather based on our love relationship with God and each other, because that's how he made decisions. That's what led him to decide to send us a Savior. As we began this short little series last week, we talked about how to make better decisions. That's something, obviously, we're all involved in. And one of the first things we said was that one of the keys to this is, who are you listening to? We all tend to listen to somebody. In fact, we talked about this last week, that many of us, that the primary advisor in our life often turns out to give us bad advice. And that primary advisor is ourselves. In other words, we can look where we talk bad decisions or we advice because we decide to go our own way and we realize that we're not always the best person to give us advice. So today you might be thinking that the next course is, is to listen to other people. Should we listen to other people 
who give us advice. As you can imagine, that's not the best plan either. We are steeped in our sins. We are flawed from the start, even if we have good intentions. Well, the same is true of anybody else that might give us their advice or their perspective, whether they intend us good or not. Oftentimes, other sources are not reliable either. And one of the things that I think is so interesting, at least during my lifetime, is that as technology has grown, as the internet has grown, as the ability and the capacity to reach more people and have more people reach us, I think we have grown exponentially in the number of so-called advisors in our lives. Go to any bookstore, and you'll see shelves and shelves of self-help books written by somebody else. So I don't know why it's called self-help, but it's somebody else telling you how to help yourself. You've never met the person, but a few pages in, you get the idea that they know something about your life and your problem, and they're telling you how to live your life. And if you're not a bookstore person, then obviously you can go on the internet, you can type stuff into Google, you can stream things through YouTube, you can watch TED Talks. You know, the, the sources are infinite. So, you know, entire television shows dedicated to you and the problems that you might be going through, and not just having sympathy for you, but how you can fix it. And if that's not good enough for you, then all you need to do is look within your family, look within somebody who sits across from you at work, somebody who goes to church with you, somebody that you meet at Starbucks. You'll find anybody and everybody who'd be willing to give you advice, and they'll usually be able to diagnose your problem all in about five seconds. You can tell that as you're sharing your problem, they kind of start nodding, and they're just kind of waiting for you to shut up so they can tell you how you should live your life you should make. And and the the amazing thing to me about this throughout time is that people can listen for a short moment and not only have the gall to tell you what you ought to do, but to do it with such confidence, to do it with such, you you know, in such an emphatic way that they feel like they've identified with your problem already and they're just waiting for you to be quiet so then they can say, you know what, and you've seen this, somebody's done this to you, they've leaned across, looked you in the eye, even pointed their finger, raised their voice, said, here's what you ought to do. And and the thing is, they mean well. In other words, if you're dating a lousy guy or gal or, you know, in a bad job or facing a tough call or something like that, hey, I know exactly what you're going through. Let me tell you what you ought to do. Here's what you ought to do. You ought to march in and you ought to... And what's your name again? I mean, you, you could have just met them. And people can be that way. But here's the thing. I don't think that ne- that's necessarily bad meaning. I think people mean well. And, and here's the thing. Not only, tell me if I'm wrong, not only have you received that, you've done that. You, you've been that person who's heard that person share. And it's usually someone you care about, someone that you love, or, or whatever it might be. And, and you don't want them to suffer anymore. You don't want them to go through hardship anymore. So you feel like you've got the right advice to give to them. So you're that one who says, I know exactly what you need to do. You just do this and all your problems will be solved. But we all know it doesn't always work that way. Whether we're the one giving the advice or receiving it, oftentimes other people, other sources give you bad advice. So I don't want you to be hopeless today because you might be thinking, all right, I think I get it. We shouldn't listen to ourselves or anybody else. So we're hopeless. We we don't have any hope at all. Now today I want to share with you from the scripture about how it is good to listen to other people but in a very different way. And we're going to use a story in 1 Kings chapter 12. Old Testament story here. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, you look at the one in front of you and you can turn to page 342. We also post our um, sermons and outlines on the YouVersion Bible app. So if you go on to YouVersion, look under events, you can find our church and you'll find the scripture and the outline there as we begin today. Um, but I will say this as you're turning there. If you're thinking, okay, I can't trust myself and I can't trust other people, then you're off to a good start, okay? Because there is a source, there is a way that we can get good advice on how to make good decisions, but it's not always in the way that we think. And we're going to read a story today in 1 Kings chapter 12 about a guy named Rehoboam, okay? Rehoboam is about to become the new king of Israel. But as you're turning there, let me just give you a little context in case you haven't been reading in Kings in a while. Um, here's the idea, the setting, the context, if you will. Um, The glory days of King David and Solomon are ending. David and Solomon were the most prosperous and most godly kings, and that's why they were prosperous, because they were godly. They listened to God, at least most of their lives. We all know the story of King Solomon, that when he follows after David, he realizes that he's, you know, way out of his league, and he asks God for a discerning heart. Literally means hearing heart. Show me how to lead these people of yours. And God makes him the wisest man who ever lived. But over time, he drifts away from God. 
He begins to follow after other religions. He begins to want to emulate other cultures. Having 700 wives will do that to you, okay? Because over time, he just marries apparently anybody and everybody. And, and the Scripture says, this isn't just conjecture, that he began to listen to his wives. And it's not about them, but so much that they led him astray to other you know, cultures and other religions. So not only did he get led astray, as a result, the nation of Israel was led astray. And they became divided in their allegiance to God. And so as a result of that, God makes the decision that the nation is going to be divided. And so God decrees through his prophets that what's about to happen is that when Solomon dies, the nation is going to be split in two. The northern half of the nation is going to be comprised of ten tribes. And it's going to be called Israel, but there's also going to be a southern kingdom of two tribes called Judah. And that's where Jerusalem, the capital, is. And God has decreed that Jeroboam, who is one of Solomon's officials, is going to lead the northern kingdom. But Rehoboam is Solomon's son. No relation, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, they sound the same, but they're not twins. But they're not related. But Rehoboam, God's, I mean, Solomon's son, is going to be the one to lead the southern kingdom. God has already decided this, declared this. So that's the context of what's going on as we get ready to read chapter 12, because Rehoboam is about to become king. But one other point of context that will be helpful. We all know that the stories of Solomon, that you know, the nation was you know, prosperous, that gold was plentiful, that silver was as common as stones in the street. Well, Solomon, in all his lavishness, put heavy taxes and heavy burdens on the people by this ending point of his life. And so the people are crying out for relief during this regime transition. So listen for that as we read this. This is a long section, but just to keep your attention here, 1 Kings chapter 12, let's begin reading. It says, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. So when Jeroboam, um, the son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, Go away for three days, and then come back to me. So the people went away. Then Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, Lighten the yoke your father put on us. The young men who had grown up with him replied, These people have said to you, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people. For this turn of events was from the Lord. By the way, don't forget that part. For this turn of events was from the Lord. To fulfill the word, the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah one of God's prophets, the Shilonite. May God add his blessing to his word. Now, there are three things at least that I think we can take from this story that can be helpful. I hope you're not hearing this today and thinking just another boring Old Testament story that has nothing to do with real life today. Actually, I think there's a lot in here that you and I can use if we can see through it of how we can make better decisions and how advice can actually be helpful, but we have to do it the right way. And we see one of the first ones right away, a good decision by Rehoboam, and it was this, write this down, to take some time to decide. He didn't just say, okay, let's do this, let's do that, or let's flip a coin, or you know, let's just go on a whim or whatever. He said, give me three days. Go away and come back in three days. Now, let's get a couple of things clear about how this applies to you and to me. First of all, Rehoboam is the king. Jeroboam is going to lead the northern nation. But Rehoboam is the king. There's no doubts there. 
He has the authority. There is no, you know, vote or anything else. I mean, he can do what he wants to do. He's the king. By the way, the same is pretty much true of your life. You're the king of your life. You can pretty much decide most things for you. Not saying you should decide by yourself, but you can. And ultimately, it is your call. So you obviously do have a lot of authority over your own life and the direction and the decisions that you make. So we all know it's going to affect a lot of people, kings, maybe perhaps a few more. But again, it's still going to affect the people around us, but it is your call. And we do make decisions, right? And we need to take some time on certain decisions. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about small things. If you're sitting at a traffic light and you're trying to decide, should I turn left or right? And then the you know, light changes green. Don't take you know, three days to decide. Um, that's usually the people I'm sitting behind. Um, I'll give you three seconds, and then I'm honking the horn. But again, it, you know, but some bigger decisions, if you can, take time. We don't always have to decide immediately. Sometimes for some reason we feel that way or we put that pressure on ourselves or other people. Sometimes it's very wise to just say, you know, give me a little bit of time. You know, let, let's take some time to make this decision. Should we take this job? Should we make this move? Should we change schools or whatever it might be? Maybe it's a good idea to take time. And one of the reasons why is because oftentimes, I know that I look back over my life, there are times when I don't know so much that I made a decision as I simply reacted to something. And I think there's a difference between a reaction and a decision. In fact, write this down in your outline. Big decisions shouldn't be reactions. Everybody knows what a reaction is. Maybe you remember this in school when you took, you know, physics class or, you know, science class. When I was in school, they used to use these things that people used to have on their desk. Maybe they still do. But that, you know, wooden thing that has the silver balls hanging down, a whole bunch of them, and you pick up one and you let it go and it hits all the silver balls. What happens? This one over here goes out, and then it comes back, and it hits that one, it does that one. And it's kind of cool for about five seconds. Then I have no idea why you want it on your desk, and I'm glad nobody ever gave me one to put on my desk. Uh, it was kind of annoying, you asked me. But, I mean, it, it proves a point, though. When there's an action, there's what? An equal and opposite reaction. And we learn that in life about things. But it doesn't mean that has to happen with everything. And I'm afraid that a lot of times, if you think about it, sometimes our reactions were the act of someone else's action. Case in point, have you ever been in an argument yelling at somebody and then about halfway through you don't know what you're arguing about? But you're yelling. And what's the reason you're yelling? They yelled at me. You know, someone marches in and how dare you do this? I can't believe you were so stupid. And you just stand up and say, well, I think you're stupid too. What are we talking about? I mean, but you've reacted because someone has acted upon you. We've all done it, Right? But I'm saying that I don't think that necessarily means that's the best decision to make, just because we feel it, just because somebody did that to us. A lot of times, I don't know about you, but there are plenty of times when I've reacted to something and my reaction, the words or the gestures or whatever it is that I did, I regretted it. I wish I didn't do that. And we've all felt that way, but what I'm trying to say to you today is that you don't have to respond that way. You don't have to have a reaction. You can take time. I remember a good friend of mine years ago he had met a girl, and he was certain she was the one. I mean, he had had six other girls before that, he was pretty certain too, but, you know, this one was the one. And so he was, you know, taking that next step in the relationship to go over to his girlfriend's parents' house to have dinner. First time meeting the parents, you know, and that kind of thing. And so he was all amped up and excited about it, that kind of thing. So it all happened, and I asked him, you know, when I saw him a couple days later, how'd it go? He said, well, the dinner part went pretty good. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I was there, and she was there, and parents were there, but her grandmother was there too, sweet little old lady, and you know, we had a good time. You know, everything was nice, and everything was proper and polite, and would you like some more? Thank you. And you know, everything went great. You know. And so he left the dinner, and I said, well, what happened then? He said, well, I had to go cross town, had to take care of a couple things, had to do this. Then I had to go back to work, and as I was driving back by on my way to work, this car pulled out in front of me. I almost you know, hit him. And I had to slam on the brakes, that kind of thing. And, but they didn't even notice me. They didn't even say anything. So I honked the horn and got mad. And finally, the, you know, the light ahead of us stopped. So I pulled up beside him to give him a piece of my mind. And it was her grandmother. Now, here's the thing. After you've yelled, after you've honked, and after you've waved a special way, you know, I mean, it's hard to take that back. 
And so when he told me this, I said, what did you do? And he said, well, my first thought was, well, maybe she's really old and has a bad memory. You get where this is going? So she won't tell the family and everything. I said, so did that work? He said, no, she has a great memory. She told the family and told the girlfriend anyway. They didn't end up getting married. He ended up marrying like number 12 or whoever it was, that special one and everything. But again, it didn't go much further. Why? Because he had a reaction. He didn't make a decision. He didn't say, you know what, maybe we're not equally yoked. Maybe this isn't a good match between our families. Maybe it's best that we go our separate ways. He reacted, and there were consequences to our reactions. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. We can feel it. We can think we're justified, but it's not always the best way to make decisions. Um, again, take some time. Can I pray about it? It's not a bad answer. Can I, you know, take a few minutes or can I call you tomorrow? Can I consult with my friends? You know, those are good decisions about making decisions. It doesn't always have to be reactions. Um, here's another good thing that we learn from Rehoboam in this story. I think this is a great one, underrated. Ask for help from others. That's a good thing. Now, you, know, you may be saying, Wade, you just said people give bad advice. There's more to it than this. He does take the time to consult others. And remember from the story, who does he ask? There's two groups of people. There's the elders, and there's the younger men that he grew up with. Now, which one should he listen to? If you're thinking the elders, I want you to pause for a minute. I want you to think about it for a minute, okay? We might think the elders because of the way the story ends and what it says, and I, can, I get that. But again, not just for Rehoboam, but for us, or whoever else that you want to consult. Whoever you would think, well, before I make this decision, I'm going to ask this person or this group or whatever. Instead of just asking, who are you listening to? I want to ask this question. Write this down. Why are you listening to them? For example, in this story, why should he listen to the elders? Are they automatically wise because they're older? Well, no, that's not true. Just being older doesn't make you wiser. I mean, with Rehoboam and Solomon, I mean, he's got a lifetime example to look at. Because Solomon, when was he wisest? When he was younger or when he was older? He was wiser when he was younger. And why? Because he was listening to God then. In his older days, he was listening to these people who were leading him astray. That's why he wasn't wise. And again, the story of Solomon is a perfect picture of the difference between being smart and being wise. Being smart means you make a 1600 on the SAT, you know lots of information, you can do really well at tests, but then you take that knowledge and you make bad decisions in life. Wisdom is taking knowledge and making good decisions. And obviously that's what we want to be. Nothing wrong with smart, I'm, all, I'm a big fan of smart, but smart doesn't make you wise, especially if you're listening to the wrong people. So the elders here, and now granted, in the Bible, elder usually means wise because they walk with God, not just because of their years of experience. The younger men could have given him good advice. When Solomon was young, he could give good advice because he walked with God. But again, the whole idea here, why are you listening to them? Here's, here's the real trick. Whoever you're listening to, whatever sources that you're considering, here's the thing to ask. If you really want to make good decisions, if you say, I really want to apply this, I'd, I'd love to walk out of here and from this point forward in my life, making better decisions, then here's what we do. We listen to others, but as we're listening, here's the question we're asking. You can write this down. Where is God in this? Not just, are they really passionate about it? Not just, does the majority go with this? But in what everybody's saying and everything that's happening here, all the factors that are going around, the decision that I've got to make, the thing that I want to know, the thing that I want to zero in is this. Where is God in this? Now, the thing about Rehoboam, we'd love to assume that he's seeking God in this. Now, his final answer probably gives us an indication what he was looking for. What's going to make me look better? What's going to be best for me? What's going to make me stronger? Notice that when the elders asked him, hey, if you're a servant to the people, that's how they began their advice. In other words, not just a king, but a servant leader. If you really care about the people, then you may want to go this way. But Rehoboam, apparently, by his choice, really didn't seem to be concerned as much about that as he was himself. So again, when we're listening to advice, whether they're elders, whether they're young people, whether they're church people, whether they're work people, whether they're family people, 
the thing that we want to try to find in it is where is God in this? Let me give you a little example that I hope will make some sense, okay? Um, I didn't have a real one, so I used something that's kind of close looking to it and everything. Have any of you ever been panning for gold? I'm just curious. Anybody ever actually done it? Looking around, maybe you went off somewhere. Probably not for a living, I'm guessing. And everything, you're not that old or not that stupid. I shouldn't say that. Um, Anyway, we'll edit that out. And so, but anyway, but have you ever had that experience where you went to a gem mine or someplace out west, they had a little touristy place, but they gave you a pan, and it has a screen in the bottom, and you got in the creek or the river, and what did you do? You, you panned for gold, right? I remember I made one as a kid. My dad was repairing the screen door, had some extra screen. I got a little piece of screen, I put some wood and did a little thing, because somehow I got it in my mind, you know, there's gold in their hills, you know, well, actually in the creek in my backyard, and I was like, oh man, this is going to be fun, I'm going to sift, I'm going to pan for gold, and it was fun for about five minutes, and then I was like, man, there's no gold in here, you know. I got bored, why? Because everything that I was looking at, what was in there? It was nothing, it was mud and sludge and bottle caps or, you know, anything else. Well, see, that's how painting works, right? You're not looking for the mud. You're not looking for the sludge or the trash. What are you looking for? Looking for the gold. And what are you doing as you're sifting through it? You're looking for something shiny. You're looking for a little nugget. Your eyes are tuned in on that. All the crud, you're just letting it wash on down the river. But you're panning, you're sifting for something valuable. Can I give you advice on getting advice? Sift it someone tells you, here's what you ought to do. Here's, you know, the way that you should go. Here, I've done this for 20 years and that kind of thing. Here's my advice. Here's my thing. Sift. See if there's something valuable in there that sparks your interest from your spirit. See, we're searching for what God has to say through people. I'll give you an example. What if at work or you know, somewhere in your school or something like that, you know, the leader makes a big decision that you really don't like and you think is bad. Maybe all departments are going to be cut 20%. I'm going to explain it at the meeting on Monday. And Friday, you and all the rest of the folks are grumbling and everything. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? And you said, I don't know. I'm going to say something. What do you all think I should say? And one person says, I think you ought to stand up and call the CEO an idiot. Not much good there. Anybody else? You know, well, I think we ought to rally and, you know, threaten to walk out. You know, tell him he can take this job and, you know. Maybe one person says, has anybody actually talked with him privately? You know, maybe, you know, it would be good to kind of hear because I remember the Scripture says that if someone sins against you, the first act is to take them aside privately, one-on-one, and, you know, show them their sin. And, you know, if it doesn't, you know, if you can win them over, then that's great found something. Now that makes sense. Now that's reasonable. That's helpful. That's valuable. Not just reacting. I'm not just going to take everything that everybody gives me and then make a guess and maybe I'll pick out something good. No, I'm, I'm looking for something godly. I'm looking for something good. So if you have a family member who loves you and has all the best intentions, sift through it. If you have a crowd of people and nine out of ten say, you ought to quit or whatever. I mean, sift through it. See where God is speaking to you through it. That's what we should be discerning and listening for when people are giving advice. Not in isolation. Not everybody else doesn't know what they're doing. But God often speaks to us through people. But we just have to sift through all the sludge that maybe isn't so godly. Here's the second idea. You've all heard this phrase before, okay? Perfect, excuse me, practice makes what? I already gave you the line. Perfect. Practice makes perfect. Wrong. It's bad advice. Practice makes perfect is bad advice. You know why? Everybody know what this is? Tell me what it is. Yeah. Putter. Golf club. Okay? You play golf with this. In fact, this is probably the first golf club you pick up when you're a kid. But what if you decide to play golf with this for the rest of your life? And your goal is to shoot par. You want to be a good golfer. They call that a scratch golfer. You can shoot par. What if you practice really hard with this putter? Will you shoot par? You're not. What if you practice really, really hard? Ain't going to happen. You know why? Because this club is not designed to hit the ball very far. 
even though you work at it and you try really hard, I bet if I worked at it, over time I could hit a little further and a little further, but I'm not going to hit this 300 yards. I'm going to be lucky to hit it 30 feet. And you know what else? This club doesn't exactly fit me. So I've got to really do this number and that kind of thing. By the way, I'm assuming this is how you hold it. Nobody ever really taught me. What if, I, no, what if nobody ever said anything, said, here, go play golf? And you know what? Practice makes perfect. So you get out there and you practice. All right, I'm practicing. How many, time, how many hours a day are you practicing? Eight. How many months have you been playing? Six. How are you doing? I stink. Now, by the way, I stink whether I have great clubs and know how to hold them or not. But you get the idea. If you're not doing it right, if you don't have the right equipment, if you don't have the right instruction, the right lesson, practice is not going to help. It's sure, you might get a little better. You might move from awful to terrible. But you're not going to be a scratch golfer. You know how you're going to be a scratch golfer? You find someone who is a scratch golfer. Not someone who talks scratch golf. I play golf with those people. I'm about, to, about you guys. Man, they talk a great game, and then they play like they're hitting this thing too. No, you talk about you go someone who actually plays that way. And you know what you do? You follow their example. You know what you do? You ask their advice. And even their advice you have to sift. Maybe that works for them, but you get the idea. How do I hold a club? How do I develop a swing? How do you hit this club versus this? What's the difference between driving and chipping? Show me. And over time, if you practice like that, that kind of practice will lead to better golf. Or so I'm told. I'll, I'll never know. But you get the idea, right? Practice doesn't make perfect. Transition, all your best efforts, all your good intentions, all your sweat, and in, you know, mean to, and I, I'm trying really hard because I've made a decision. And now, whether that decision is going to be good or not is based on how hard I try. Wrong. Now, I admire effort. I admire practice. I admire diligence. But see, there's one other person that Rehoboam forgot to talk to in this story to ask advice from. And obviously, that's from God. Notice that when he has the decision, he says, give me three days. Good advice. Let me ask some others. Great job. But never once does he go to the prophets. See, the prophets are rarely mentioned in this story, at least given the attention that they're due. You see, we read in the story earlier about how Ahijah, he was the prophet, he was the last verse there, that he was the one that God had spoken through that said that Jeroboam was going to be the king in the north, Rehoboam was going to be the king in the south. Now, as a result of this, Rehoboam decides he's going to assemble his armies, he's going to attack Jeroboam, he's going to make the whole nation his. You know why? Because he's king and he's strong. And I'll make it happen because I'm tough and I'm me and I and I and I. But look at the end of chapter 12. We're going to close with this. I want you to see this, not just for Bible history, but application for you and me. Because you know what? Sometimes you and I make decisions and we're trying hard and we mean well, but there's something else maybe we didn't consider. You're going to see it in this part. Chapter 12, verse 22. But this word of God came to Shammai, uh, Shemaiah, excuse me, came to Shemaiah, the man of God, the prophet, okay? Verse 23. Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all Judah, not just him, and Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, to the rest of the people. This is what the Lord says. Do not go up to fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. Take some time to circle that. This is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord ordered. You know what? I think you and I, this is me, maybe it applies to you. There are many times in my life when I've got something right in my hands. I've got to make a decision. I've got to figure out what to do with this. I've got to make a call and go somewhere with it. I'm talking to these folks. I'm talking to these folks. And all the while, God's going, you haven't asked me. And here's why this is important, because I'm the one who put that thing in your hand. Sometimes we're facing roadblocks. We're not making progress. It's not working. And you know why? Because God has said, this thing is of me, not you. It's not about what you decide. In fact, the best decision you can make is to learn what I'm doing and to follow me in that in obedience instead of trying to do it your way. 
or what seems right to you or what seems right to your advisors or what the majority says, this is my doing. So I want to invite you to join with me in prayer right now. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to me and to each of us now to give us just a moment of revelation to realize that some of the decisions and the struggles of our lives, the choices that we have, that as we're trying to decide, you're saying, this is my thing that I'm doing. There are some things you have determined. I know that there's been times in my life when I've tried to kick a door open and you've said, I've closed it. It's not happening. It's not how hard you try. You can consult with everybody you like. The door's not opening. And it's not because you don't have enough faith or you didn't say the right prayer. It's because this is my thing I'm doing. Because I've opened another door. But you've got a decision whether you're going to face that or not. In fact, let us all just pray before God right now and say, Lord, I just pray that I can turn more and more away from the stuff and the advice of the world and really focus my attention on you. Lord, what do you have to say? Where are you in this thing? That's what I want to know. Because if we can align ourselves with what God is saying and what God is doing, then we're in the position to make the best decisions. In fact, I just want to confess today, Lord, I can't discern my own way. I can't find my own path even when I think I can, even when I think I should. Instead, I want you to reveal it to me. I pray, Lord, that you will close doors, even the ones that I want open. I do pray that you will open doors, even if it's the one that I didn't choose. But more than anything, that you'll give me the discernment to be able to determine which one is of you, where are you at work, God, I want, to, I want to date this person. I think she's the one, he's the one. Sometimes you're going to close that door and it's only later on that we'll be grateful. Other times it's a work issue. It's a health issue. It's a money issue. It's a personal, a private issue. But all of those things you're involved in, your hands at work, I am 100% certain that when we get to heaven and our eyes are open, we're going to see that you've been involved in your creation long, long after those first six days. You're still involved. You're still intimate. You're still working. There's still things that you are doing. So Lord, I pray that you would humble all of us. It's not so much about me and what I decide and what I think is wise. But I pray that I can listen better, that I can filter through, sift through all the things that are happening around me focus on what you have to say, what you are doing. So let's just all pray together now this just prayer, Lord, this thing that you're doing, I want to be a part of it. I don't want to fight against it. I don't want to try to talk you out of it. But this thing that you're doing, whatever my place is in that, I submit to you for that. I'll serve. I'll go. I'll give. I'll speak. I'll sacrifice, but I want to be in the thing you're doing, and I want to trust in you, and I pray this in Christ's name, amen. As we continue to worship, the altar will be open for you to come. I want you to feel comfortable to move, not pressured to move, not supposed to, but just, if you say, I want to come and lay a decision before the Lord, I want to lay my arrogance before the Lord, because I've been kicking in doors lately, and I need to lay that before him. If you want to intercede for another person, maybe you've got a friend, a family member. I know that I can feel this way sometimes. You want to help them make a good decision. You think they're making a bad decision. You can't change the course. Maybe that's not of you. Maybe God's not giving you that. But you can keep praying for them. And maybe you want to come and pray for that family member today. If you'd like to join our church, as some have done recently, see me afterward. I'd love to walk you through those steps. And if you'd like to learn how to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I've got great news for you. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't all have to make all the best decisions. I'm going to trust Him and not myself. I'm going to trust Him and not the world. 
I'm going to trust him and not my works. I'm going to place my life in the hands of Jesus. And that's where salvation comes for all of us. So you respond today as God is speaking to you. Let's stand together and let's worship.
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world that the treasure will be found. day here at Walden First Baptist and today we want to take a little bit of time and recognize 20 years of service and commitment from Wade and Elizabeth Leonard. You'll come join me. As a church, we appreciate your faithfulness. We have been blessed by your unwavering commitment. We're thankful to have you leading our church family. There's no way to give an account of all the amazing things that have happened in this 20 year span. However, we're thankful for you and we want you to know that you are loved and appreciated. So on behalf of Malden First Baptist, a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. I know that I can speak for Elizabeth in that. We're just thankful to have been a part of our church family here for more than 20 years now. Um, sometimes it's easy to forget Elizabeth and I were church members before I ever came to serve on staff. Um, and I was asked by the previous administration to come and take a role and then for the church to ask me to be the interim and then the pastor. And, um, it's all flown by, but one thing that remains the same through it all is that, you know, Again, I feel like this is our family. And uh, family isn't always perfect. Doesn't mean everything always goes well, we all agree, but we're always family. And again, I'm just privileged to be able to serve with you all. And you know, whatever it is that I do or say, kind of like I was saying earlier, whether no matter what I preach or no matter what I do or what I say, I hope you'll always sift through it and you know, find where God is speaking to you. But uh, just to be a part of it in any way is an honor for us. And, Another thing that I'll say is that one thing that means a lot to me is that y'all are good to my wife. So if you ever want to be good to me, be good to her. So thank y'all very much. Would you stand as we dismiss this morning? The Apostle Paul in Romans 15 reminds us, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Have a great week. Amen. Thank you. Church, Malden, South Carolina.